Uh, so the intention of today is obviously to network and to have fun. Uh, we have founders, we have VPs, we have executives. Uh, the intention of today is obviously with that focus around uh, retention. Uh, but again, uh, we're also going to have a little bit fun while doing it. But we also want to educate you a little bit further around what retention nowadays is able of doing for you all. Um, we all know what the market situation is nowadays. Uh, a couple of years ago, specifically when we're looking at our own customer base, I mean, the trending line was going up, 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 up. Sky was the limit. And what we're seeing right now, I mean, it depends a lot on the organization or the industry that you're in. But we're seeing a lot of fluctuations happening. So we kind of felt like this is the right time to have a little bit of a discussion around retention, some of the strategies that you can do in order to retain your customers. Uh, we're going to do a 10 to 15 minute panel. Uh, we also always want to have it interactive. So we have a couple of questions, uh, but do feel free. Uh, we are going to have some Q&A after the questions to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, with me today, uh, obviously, well, guys, do an introduction. I can start. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Balint. Uh, my title is Senior Product Manager for Subscriptions at Prêt à Manger. Uh, but in practice, I just build stuff. Um, so my background is in startups. I worked in various startups uh, between Paris and London, um, and then joined Pret, I think, a year and three or four months ago now. I can't really keep track. Um, big fan of the subscription. I was a coffee subscriber before I joined Pret, so I had a lot of ideas uh, even before I, I, I came in. Um, and yeah, very excited to uh, share a little bit about my experience. Hi, everybody. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Jump the gun. Um, my name is Marcus. I work for Butternut Box. Uh, we are Europe's leading fresh dog food company. Uh, I've been with the company for about five and a half years and had a few different roles with them. Started off building a sales team there, moved into analysis, and that moved towards retention as we became more focused at not growth at all costs, but uh, the retention curve, lifetime value, and payback. And so now I'm leading the commercial team there, focused on everything to do with lifetime value, uh, the retention curve, additional product sales, and essentially how can we make the most out of our customers with the proposition that we have. So yeah, super happy to be here. Thank you for having us. All right, hey, uh, let's get started. So uh, my first question uh, to both of you. So why was it so important uh, in your roles and in your business uh, to start a retention strategy while you did? And why did you actually take that leap? Um, I can start. Um, so it kind of all started last year, I guess. We fixed ourselves some very ambitious uh, goals for the end of the year in terms of total number of subscribers that we want to achieve. Um, the decision for those aggressive objectives were very business-led because uh, we know for a fact how valuable the subscribers are for the business. Um, to give you an idea, uh, a subscriber for us uh, transacts, I think, 28 times on average per month. Uh, versus two times for a non-subscriber. So it's just out of this world. Um, that makes it four times more valuable for us to have a subscriber rather than have a, a regular customer. Um, so there's definitely been a focus on kind of growing that base. So in a subscription business, how do you grow that base? I mean, it's not rocket science. You can either get more people in or you can get less people out. So uh, that's what, where we focused on. To get more people in, we had a bunch of initiatives, marketing, promotion. Um, we have an amazing, very popular first month half price offer. Um, so we're kind of covered on that base. So uh, we figured that the opportunity, the lift, was more on the managing the churn and getting less people to get away from, from us. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's basically where we started working with um, the amazing Chargebee team and, uh, and their recently launched retention product. Um, to kind of we, to, to give you context, we didn't do any kind of any form of win back or any form of uh, actively managing the retention offers or any kind of uh, optimization of the cancellation journey. Um, so we kind of started from there and kind of increased uh, our interest in, in that area. And so that's how we got started. If I can zoom in uh, on one thing that you just mentioned, basically about uh, the return that you're seeing of a subscriber uh, versus, let's say, a walk-in. Were you expecting uh, those results? Um, we kind of always known uh, because we see how often they come back. I mean, who wouldn't you want to maximize the subscription? That's the reason it's, it's there. So we kind of knew that. But um, as the time goes, we have more and more data to understand better the behaviors. And we, we can go more granularly into that. So that's a very interesting aspect of, of my job as well. Yeah. Same question. Same question. Uh, similar answer. 
Um, we, well, when I first joined at the beginning of the company, we were obviously focused on just getting our product out there into the hands of many dog owners as possible, trying to prove that our proposition was something that customers would genuinely value. But after a while, and especially as we were burning a lot of cash early doors, and we are moving towards the later sort of fundraising rounds, we really had to start thinking about lifetime value and sort of what does it actually, when can we pay back on our, our CAC, our customer acquisition costs. And uh, for us, I think we had that similar moment where we're thinking about customers coming in, customers going out. We always talked about the leaky bucket. How can we make the bucket less leaky? And uh, we started to see not only in terms of our payback cycles, but for us to grow week on week, we needed to stop people leaving. And it was, it was as simple as that. And uh, so, yeah, there's that moment where it's not only commercially the right thing, but for the growth of the company, for our active subspace, which the whole team was so focused around, uh, to really just a decimal point swing on weekly churn would mean we either grew or we shrunk in a given week. And that was really the moment for us where retention's a big focus, let's invest in it now. Awesome. Uh, Balint, can you uh, paint us a picture uh, around the, the organization and the numbers that you're seeing uh, before and after uh, you incorporated the retention strategy? Um, and maybe to elaborate a little bit further, maybe what was actually the original intention or the idea to start this? Uh, and again, are you seeing the, uh, the expected results? Yeah, um, I mean, it is quite interesting. So the before, the before times, uh, our retention strategy was all about building the best subscription possible and making the customer experience as smooth as possible, both digitally and in the shop. Because we figured um, if that experience is good, then people will stay on. If we bring values to our customers, they will not leave. So that was mostly uh, the biggest focus. So there's a bunch of ways that we worked on this. Um, some examples, so Pret, we're very much into the kind of like keeping it fresh. So we're constantly trying to update our menus, uh, launching new drinks, managing the ice availability. Uh, we recently launched Club Pret, and uh, with it came a new kind of discount that we're uh, trying out, which is the 10% discount on all foods if you're a subscriber. So we're really trying to kind of launch those kinds of things. Um, then there's also promotions, so very specifically for subscribers or targeting within the, the, those segments, um, promotions for you. One of the examples was the coronation chicken that we did uh, recently where we gave away a coronation um, chicken sandwich uh, for our subscribers on the coronation day. Um, that was quite successful. Um, and we're also constantly working on features. So um, for instance, uh, we recently overhauled the pause feature. So the pause functionality, uh, is much more flexible now. And one of the reasons behind that was that it seems logical that we want people to pause instead of canceling if they're going on holidays, for instance. So these were kind of the active ways that we're trying to manage uh, you know, um, retention. Um, the after times, uh, we added quite a lot of things. Uh, so the biggest one was uh, kind of the retention offers. Uh, we had none of those before, and those are a key part of uh, incentivizing the customers to stay a bit more and to um, increase the lifetime value as well. So um, there's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of things that we're doing right now. Um, very important for us was to build it in a capability uh, way. The reason is, I don't know if everyone knows that, but there's the subscription at Pret is in the UK, but we're also in the US and France. And we really needed the uh, local markets to be able to come up with their own retention strategies. And so the way to build it was to be scalable as we also prob probably will launch more countries in the future um, so that everyone can kind of like almost self-serve uh, what kind of uh, cancellation journey they want the customers to see, what kind of retention offers they get, maybe even go into segmentation, uh, and uh, some people get some offers, other people get other offers. And all of this was very important to build it this way from the get-go. So this is kind of what we're focusing on right now, and we're continuing to improving every, every day. We found it's a similar thing, especially we've recently opened up in the Netherlands, started selling there and we've recently acquired a Polish version of Butternut Box as well. And the ability to have bespoke pause reasons, pause offers, segmentation has been incredibly powerful for us. Maybe a quick uh, follow-up question uh, for you both, uh, since you're doing the retention strategy in, uh, in different markets and different countries. I know it's basically still early days, but can you already spot some uh, maybe cultural differences in the type of strategy that you're doing in different markets and different countries? 
Uh, we're, we're maybe a bit early for that. Um, I think we're kind of choosing to take our time, if that makes sense. We want to, we're very conscious to be a very data-based approach. So for now, we're more in the like, beginning part. We only recently launched retention as a whole feature. So um, I can definitely see it. We're working on, on doing more segmented uh, offers. So that is kind of, uh, I think, the next step, the, the next logical step, I, I would say. For us, I think we've seen uh, just how comfortable people are with subscription as a concept really varies in different markets. Subscription rejection in the Netherlands for us, and we expect that this will be the case across Central Europe, will be a significantly bigger issue than it is in, in GB. Um, and so that's something that we're trying to come up with bespoke solutions from the Benelux team who are, you know, they're from the place. Uh, hopefully they'll be able to think of some original positionings of the subscription which will work a little bit better than you know, what we're thinking about in GB. Yeah. Hey Marcus, uh, staying for you, uh, with you for a moment, uh, what kind of recommendations do you have from everybody here uh, around what you need to do when you're rolling out your uh, retention strategy and then particularly some of the learnings that you've done in building out the team and everything around it? Yeah, definitely. Um, so implementation of the retention strategy wasn't necessarily like a single quarter or a period or month where we're like, right, here we're gonna, we're gonna go retention strategy now. It was a building conversation over time. What we did quite early on, which we think was really beneficial, is that we defined metrics as a sort of leadership group, made those metrics very visible and very easily accessible, and then worked with each department around the company, even if they were sort of adjacent retention, uh, retention adjacent, to think of something that they could do to impact the retention number and show that in a test. Even if that meant that you know, we were investing quite a lot of time in an initiative that wasn't really gonna move the needle for the group, it meant that when the big pieces came along, the big picture changes, everybody knew the vocabulary, everybody could pull in the same direction, they all understood the value of what we were doing and why it was so important to the wider business. So I think that, that the clarity of the metrics and then taking the time to speak to people individually about why it's important was really, really good. And then in terms of the hiring stuff, it's something we've played around with a lot. I don't know, Balan, if you have this experience, but like we've, with our digital product and our tech teams, we're always redefining who's focusing on what, what's the remit of one team, what's the remit of the other team. And we've eventually we've got to quite a good place of splitting up a team which is exclusively focused on retention and retention initiatives. And then we also have a core experience team who are focused on sort of longer term, how can we change the proposition to make it more attractive to our customers in the long term. What's been really beneficial is as I've built a commercial team, I've had a commercial manager who sat in with each one of those digital product tech teams and is there to be able to essentially prioritize and build like a really accurate business case for how is this going to move the metrics, what do we expect, what assumptions are we relying on, and what should we do first, second, and third. And that has really helped us focus on what's going to be most important to the customer, apportion company and like resource in the right places, and we've started to see things sort of build from the foundation up rather than just doing something that looks cool, maybe it moves the metrics for a little bit and then it drops back in you know, the next quarter, sort of working on more fundamental, bigger pieces that uh, see the real percentage point swings. So yeah, I'd say building, having people focus on retention and then having people who sort of, they live and breathe it day in, day out, and yeah. they can go and work with the other teams has been a big win for us. If I can uh, zoom in uh, a little bit. So personally, I always learn more from my failures than my successes. And obviously hindsight is uh, 20, it's, uh, I mean, hindsight is hindsight. So looking back, is there anything with the knowledge that you have now that would you potentially have done different? Yeah, I think there's loads of stuff actually. Yeah, I think there are some things that we're, as a dog company, we're full of people, we're pretty much all dog owners in the company and we love dogs. And oftentimes we'll come up with things and we'll be like, oh my God, my dog would love this. And we'll go and be like, great, that's going to be a gifting strategy. We're going to give them all these great gifts in their first couple of boxes. They're going to think button-up boxes are the best thing in the world, free toys. But actually what it looks like for the customer is, I'm just getting some cheap piece of some random toy. What I'd much prefer is to have five pounds off my box. And it was really like trying to disconnect ourselves from like 
what we thought was cute because it had our company logo on it and some funny pun, and actually what was valuable to the customer. It took a bit of time for us to disconnect those two things. So, yeah, I, I hate to think of how much money we've spent on uh, pointless gifting uh, exercises. Yeah, that would probably be one I'd revi revisit in if I had my time again. Give him a couple of drinks and ask the question again, and uh, you <laughs> might find out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, staying, uh, staying for you for a moment. So, uh, how important was the payment strategy uh, around retention? And uh, is that strategy important to uh, reduce failure rates, uh, for example? 100%, 100%. So, we originally we were just exclusively card payment. Uh, then we introduced Apple Pay. And we were like, this is crazy. Like the customers who are coming through on Apple Pay, they're retaining so much better. We thought we'd sort of change the world. But then we realized that actually the customers who are coming through on Apple Pay probably just had a bit more money. They were using Apple products and they were also maybe more sort of tech literate rather than some of the other customers that we had. But we still saw time after time as we introduced more and diverse payment methods, we were seeing failure rates drop and customer satisfaction increase. We, you know, we recently introduced Go, Go Cardless, and it's our first sort of foray into direct debit, and that's something we've always been super interested in. Not necessarily as a, like a conversion mover, although we have seen benefits there, but just giving the variety to customers to be able to schedule payments in the way that they want, for them to track payments in the way that they want, and that level of control, like it's a big thing for us, flexibility and control is a core pillar of our pro proposition. And that, uh, that extends in like the plans, the recipes, the additional products that they add on, but also in the way and when they pay as well. So I'd say a, a good suite of payment types has been like a, a core thing and something that we'll continue to work on over time. Nice. Uh, last question before I uh, open it up to, uh, to all of you. Uh, question for you both. Um, what are maybe some of the predictions looking in today's market? that you have in the, in the quarters and years to come? Um, I mean, it's, it's always awkward. I can, I can start it. Uh, it's always awkward to talk about the future. Uh, just keeping, I mean, like, I'm just a guy with a mic here. Uh, but, um, I mean, one of the lessons that uh, I kept learning in subscription is that it's always easier to retain someone uh, than to try to find someone new to replace them. So I think, like, that's a little bit cliche, but it's always very true. Um, it is a... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, something that I learned as well is, um, more especially at Pret, uh, is that you can do all, if, if any of you are working currently on like retention strategies right now, um, any effort that you put into that will only be cosmetic if the underlying offering is not going to be valuable for your customers, especially now that, uh, you know, cost of living crisis, there's a lot of talk around uh, recessions. Uh, it is very, very important to focus on the problem solution fit first and then use retention strategies, win back, whatever, um, kind of as, uh, as a tool to allow the, your customers to justify to stay on longer. So it shouldn't be the core focus, it should be kind of like what helps you to achieve the lifetime value and the churn that you're aiming. So that is kind of, I think, something that people will be focusing on a lot more in the future. And uh, I would recommend anyone to focus on that. Yeah. I completely agree with that. I think around uh, thinking about uh, in terms of predictions for the future, I have absolutely no idea. One thing that we'll be working on is making sure that our proposition continues to be more and more valuable over time and thinking about ways that, you know, in an in a environment where customers are looking to cut their costs wherever they can, how can we make our offering as flexible as it can possibly be, even if that means that they're not feeding their dog 100% butternut box, so that's fine. Can we find different ways for you to just still get the feeling that you're doing the right thing for your dog, even if that's only 10, 20% of your dog's bowl? Um, and then also, I think for us, we want to be thinking, as you said, about like how can the proposition get better? How can we take maybe more of the wallet share and centralize our customers' dog spending, their general spending in with us and then they can have the convenience and we can leverage our existing infrastructure, our existing relationships to cover more things like pet care, the toys, the treats and everything that goes alongside that. And maybe that's where our, the value comes from because they're getting it all from one place rather and they're happy to pay a bit more for the convenience of that. So yeah, in terms of the predictions, I think have to keep 
really spend a lot of time iterating and being inventive about how our proposition can improve and how we can deliver that to our customers in the most convenient way possible. Yeah. Uh, if I can give you a quick prediction from what we're seeing uh, at Chargebee, particularly around the questions that we're getting from our customer base, uh, but also some of the new customers that are coming our way. If I would ask each and every one of you right now, how many subscriptions do you currently have? I have a 99% uh, idea that the answer is going to be, I don't know. And whatever number that you give me, I have a pretty decent understanding and it's probably going to be more. Uh, so what I'm trying to say this uh, is subscription fatigue, uh, it is a real thing. And what we're definitely seeing nowadays is a shift uh, from let's say uh, a fixed term subscription to more of a usage based subscription where you either pay per event or actually only pay purely for the amount uh, of usage that you've done for a particular subscription. Uh, so if this is something that you're thinking about doing right now, uh, it's completely in the trend that we're uh, noticing. Uh, some of the other trends that we're seeing, and Pratt was actually one of the first mover, um, is a m true merger of online and offline. Uh, so I mean, I know we've all heard about Omnichannel before. Uh, I know I've basically been hearing this for the last five to 10 years. But what we're seeing right now is actually <laughs> what everybody has been speaking and talking about for the last five, six years, really in action. Uh, and we're really seeing the ROI for the companies that are doing this. So Pratt is a great example, but don't be surprised if in the next one or two years, a lot of supermarkets, uh, restaurants, and other change, uh, and changes are basically going to be incorporating more loyalty schemes uh, which are then also with a premium paid model that can actually allow you special discounts or other special treatments if you basically become a member of them. So this is some of the things uh, that we're seeing that are coming uh, well, all of our way.